Okay, let me uh, first thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, give this talk on um, how lasers are impacting the development of accelerators. So, over here you see an image of uh, Ernest Lawrence, uh, the founder of our lab at Berkeley Lab, uh, holding a little cyclotron in his hand. And in a matter of 80 years, this cyclotron went from something that you can hold in your hand to something that's 27 kilometers in circumference and can store energy up to about 300 megajoule. Accelerator technology also, from the 1960s, uh, delivered 50 GV, 50 giga electron volt electron beams in machines that were about two miles long. And what I would like to talk to you about is sort of progress and status on making these machines smaller again using lasers. And so this is basically the laser-based particle acceleration, the path to TEV, tera electron volt physics, as well as compact X-ray and gamma ray sources. So if you, if you think about traditional accelerators, and there's a picture here of a superconducting cavity, the issue is that these superconducting cavities can only sustain electric fields of the order of 10 to 40 megavolt per meter, because otherwise you'll start getting breakdown in these cavities. What we work on in our field is these laser-driven structures where the fields can be 10 to 100 gigavolt per meter. And so for the same net energy output, you can make your device about 1,000 times smaller. And the question that I will try to answer here is, can this technology be developed to a sufficient level of sophistication for colliders, light sources, medical, or even security applications? And so the outline of my talk is here. I want to first talk a little bit about how these things work. And it all comes down to controlling the plasma structure. So second part is a very brief tour of things that we already can do with these sources here, terahertz radiation, XUV radiation, X-rays, and gamma rays. And then last but not least, colliders. And this is by far the most challenging application of our, of our technology. And then I'll give you an overview of a big step that we're taking towards developing these colliders with a, um, a commercial petawatt system that runs at one hertz and experiments that we will do, be doing with this system. And then I'll talk a little bit, since this is a, a laser photonics uh, meeting, also what would we like to have in the next 10 to 20 years in terms of laser needs. So let's start with the basic physics. So the basic physics, if you, if you remember one thing from my talk, uh, or if you like to fall asleep during my talk, just dream about surfing. This is a California tradition, so you take your boat, the boat plows through the water and excites a wave, and this guy is brave enough to wakeboard behind this, this boat here. So what we're doing in our physics is essentially the lake becomes a plasma, an ionized gas. The motor boat is replaced by a laser pulse. The wave we call a wake behind the laser pulse. And the surfers in our case are electrons. And so that's sort of the basic, the basic picture. And if you look at this wave here, what you find is that the speed of this motor boat is pretty much the same as the speed with which this wave rolls through the ocean. And that's important. Uh, in our case, because it's a laser pulse, this wave propagates pretty much at the speed of light through the, through the plasma. So let's dig in just a little bit more. What actually happens? So you take a very intense laser pulse, and you shoot it into this mix of electrons and ions that are swirling through each other in the plasma. The laser pulse comes in, and it starts snow plowing the electrons out of the way because of what we call the pound motive force, the, the intensity gradient of this intense laser. What I mean by intense is typically 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 19th watts per square centimeter. Electrons get pushed out of the way, and the heavy ions are left behind. After some time, typically measured in femtoseconds, these electrons get pulled back by the restoring force from the ions here, and now you have done charge separation. You have positive charges and negative charges. This is an electric field. And this electric field propagates, as I said, with the speed of the laser pulse. 
which is the speed of light. So if you manage to suck some of these electrons into this structure here, these can attain, in a matter of millimeters, relativistic energies. So that's sort of the basic physics. At Berkeley Lab, we took the, uh, back in, in the 90s, we took the decision, uh, let's build these devices following the paradigm of a conventional accelerator. So if you think about a conventional accelerator, you would have a, a photocathode injector. That's where the electrons come out. And then you have an RF structure, typically copper or superconducting structure. And you have a power source that powers this RF structure. What we're doing is we're replacing all of these same elements. So we take a laser as a drive source. We develop injection techniques. And then we develop structures that no, not only can guide the laser beam over, in, over long distances. Remember, this is 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 19 watts per square centimeter. So you basically have to develop fibers that can sustain these intensities and can allow the laser beam to propagate. And these structures here are also designed to make sure that the wake has the proper shape. So this is the equivalent of the RF cavity that you're building. The way we build these fibers is by relying on a density difference between the center of the structure and, and the walls, just like in a conventional fiber, where you have a high index of refraction in the middle, low index of refraction at the edges. So in order to design this, you think of these, the, the following key physics. The first one is the diffraction of the laser pulse. I already mentioned we basically built optical fibers that sustain these very high intensities. And as I mentioned, the way these fibers are, are built is essentially by hydrodynamic shock excitation. So you heat a plasma in the middle, make it very hot. It pushes plasma out, leaving a lower density of plasma in the middle of the structure and a higher plasma density on the edges. That's exactly an optical fiber. This allows us to beat, beat one of the, what we call the three Ds of laser accelerators, the diffraction of the laser pulse. The second one has to do with the basic physics of these waves and surfing. When you think about a surfer riding a wave, after some distance, the surfer is starting to go faster than the wave. This is very important, and we call this dephasing of the particle with the wave. And this is basically the mechanism that will limit the amount of acceleration a particle will get. Even if you have 100 gigavolt per meter, if your particle starts outrunning the wave, it can no longer feel the electric field. It will go into a decelerating phase. And the third one is, basically, there is no free lunch. If you have laser power that you've dumped into the structure to excite the wave, after some distance, your laser pulse will be so distorted it will have redshifted, it will start to diffract because it's been depleting its energy into the plasma. And that means that after some distance, you have to put a fresh laser pulse into it. And that's what we call cascading of modules. So these are three important physics uh, aspects. How are the experiments typically done? The setup is shown here. You take a laser pulse, focus it into some structure, we use at Berkeley Lab capillary discharge structures. They are basically low current discharges in sapphire plates, and they produce automatically this little waveguide structure. You focus the laser pulse at the entrance, it guides through, and if you do things right, you get an electron beam out. And then you have a big magnetic spectrometer, and you look at a phosphor screen to look at the energy of the electron beam. So we started doing these experiments with guided structures in the early 2000s. And this led to this work here, which got the cover of Nature in 2004. And we produced, for the first time, electron beams with just a few percent energy spread, up to about 100 MeV with an 8 terawatt laser pulse. And this was the first time this was, this was done. And there were three groups in the world that sort of concurrently uh, receive, uh, um, obtained very similar results. Uh, my group at Berkeley. Uh, Imperial College Rutherford Appleton Laboratory and the uh, Laboratoire d'Optique Appliquée in Paris. And this triggered us to go for a bigger laser and longer structures. And in 2006, we were the first group to demonstrate that by using these capillary discharge waveguides, 
and a 40 terawatt laser pulse, we got over a GEV electron beam in a device that you can literally hold between you, your two fingers. So if you go with traditional technology, this would be roughly a soccer or football field long uh, electron accelerator. So now we also learned something interesting during these experiments. If you look here, this is the beam energy versus the plasma density. If you think back of this charge separation picture, the fields actually go like the square root of the density. So the higher the density, the higher the fields that you can excite in the plasma. But the problem is the speed with which the laser pulse propagates. And the speed depends on one over the density to the three halves. So you actually lose by going to higher densities and you gain by going to lower densities. And that's exactly what we did in these experiments. So the energy gain goes like one over the density. The lower the density, the longer your structure, but the longer your particle can ride the wave. Now there was a problem, and that is that if you keep lowering the density, as shown here, the chance of you creating an electron bunch goes to zero. Essentially, after some distance, or sorry, after some density, you are no longer able to trap electrons. So you have these two conditions. Lower density is needed for higher energy, but higher density is needed for injection. So basically, it comes down to this here. If you look at this wave here, you have these surfers riding it. But this here, the white foam on this wave is what we call self-injection. That is water that's actually really moving forward. These guys are nicely synchronized and are riding this wave here. And if you don't do things carefully, you got this guy who is injected out of phase. So this is very important that if you want to produce a quality beam, you have to control injection. So we decided to engineer it. And we engineered it by embedding into these sapphire blocks a little supersonic gas jet right here. So this is a f about a 500 micron little region where we produce high density. The wave temporarily slows down. Electrons can get trapped, and then you lower the density to speed up the wave, and you have your whole structure. So in this device here, this is only three centimeters long, you can now do controlled injection by not just ta tailoring the transverse distribution in your waveguide, but also the longitudinal distribution. If you think back about that picture that I showed in the beginning of the superconducting cavities, people send, spend months and months and years and years designing these cavities to have just the right properties. That's what we're doing right now with the plasma structures. Radially controlling them and longitudinally controlling them. So when you do this, you can play around with where you focus your laser beam, you can control the energy of the electron beam, or if you leave it fixed, you can get a stable 300 MeV beam coming out of your device with a control that wasn't done previously with this technique here. And this technique we call down-ramp injection. So it gives you a sense of where we are in the field with these beams here. So it opens up a couple applications, and I'll quickly go through those before I get to the collider. The first one is terahertz radiation. When an electron beam goes from a medium of one index of refraction into a medium with another index of refractions, the fields have to rearrange and you get a burst of radiation coming out, which we call transition radiation. Because the electron bunches that we are producing out of these devices are riding in plasma waves that are only of the order of 50 femtoseconds or so, these bunches are intrinsically short. They're intrinsically just a few femtoseconds long. And when they leave the plasma, they emit coherent radiation in the terahertz. And we've measured microjoule level terahertz from 1 to 10 terahertz with this device. The second thing that you get for free out of this device is a little bit more complicated. It looks like an eyeball, but it's not an eyeball. This is the laser here. It has pushed the electrons out of the way. And as I mentioned in the f one of the first slides, some of these electrons get pulled in and they ride the wave. Now, when they get pulled in off axis, what they're going to do is oscillate around. And they're oscillating around in a column of positive charge. 
It's like a little undulator. You built a micro undulator in your plasma, and that generates kilovolt to 10 kilovolt X-rays coming out of the device all for free. So a number of groups showed this. And this is an image from the Imperial College group. With this source, they've now done phase contrast imaging at the few kilovolt level. And this is, I think, a damselfly, which is usually done on synchrotrons. So this is starting to look like a poor man's synchrotron light source, where you are working with these very high quality X-ray beams, femtosecond X-ray beams. And so it's starting to open up a whole new area for this type of research. The other application is free electron lasers. I'm sure you've all heard of the SLAC LCLS, the LINAC Coherent Light Source, which has revolutionized X-ray science because it has now coherent light with extreme brightness that people are using for fundamental science. What we are trying to do in our field is instead of using a good part of a mile-long LINAC, could we do this again at a small scale? So you use your small accelerator, make sure that you control injection in the properties of the electron beam, and then you basically send it through an undulator, just like you would do for a classical undulator. And this is being pursued by many groups around the world. Strathclyde, Soleil in Paris, Plasmonics in, in Italy, uh, the Munich group are now also at DAISY, the Eli beam lines, which I will say a few words about, and here is a DAISY group. And then here, a couple other groups in, in Asia that are all pursuing, can we get high quality enough beams to do this type of experiment? You have your little accelerator, transport it through your undulator, and then look for light. We are one of the groups doing this. This is an image of XUV light at the 30 to 40 nanometer produced by these electron beams. So this is exciting because this would be, again, a application that normally you would have had to go to the large laboratories where if this technology matures enough to produce these quality beams that you could actually uh, generate this radiation. There's also applications on gamma ray production. This is a, a complicated chart here, but what, what we are doing here is we're taking a drive laser, sending it over here, producing electron beams, and then with the same laser, scattering it off these electron beams and basically do an inverse Compton scattering source. This is a Homeland Security application because they are interested in gamma rays from the few MeV out to 20 MeV to probe special materials. If you would do this with a conventional LINAC, you're talking about a machine of 100 meter. In our case, this could be trailer size devices. Interestingly enough, with this technology that we have, you don't need magnets to steer your electron beam. Basically, we are picking up our LINAC and pivoting it around the entrance point of the optical fiber. And that's what we did here, just to demonstrate that we would be able to steer the electron beam. So you make sure that the laser beam comes in at the right place. And now, depending on your angle of your capillary, your waveguide, essentially, you can either steer the beam high, this is energy versus output angle, in the middle or low. This is all in an effort to make these things very compact. So let me go to the collider. So being at a, at a national lab where the history was embedded in accelerator um, devices, we were asked to think about, could we build some time into the future a electron-positron collider and what would it take? So this is very far into the future, but it helps to think about what do we need to do today in terms of accelerator technology, in terms of laser technology, to have a chance of 20 years from now building a machine that could revolutionize particle physics. The first thing is the particle physics guys tell us they need an energy in their beam of the order of a TeV, center of mass. And they'd like to have all of this in a device that's off the order of a soccer field long maybe a few soccer fields, but not 30 kilometers if they, could, if they could get it. So that tells you that you better think about technology that allows you to go to 10 gigavolt per meter, otherwise you do need these multi-multi-kilometer devices. They also like luminosity. Luminosity is essentially a measure 
for how bright your beams are at the collision point and how long you will have to wait for, for physics to come out in the collision of these two beams. If your luminosity is long, your PhD will take 20 years instead of five years. That's sort of a measure of, of luminosity. That means you need beam power, you need beam quality. And that's very difficult. The, the current designs require these electron beams to get focused down to the few tens of nanometer. And then also it should be affordable. If society wants to build a machine like this and it's going to cost over $20 billion, this could be a serious problem for our community. So you need wall plug efficiency. That means a technology choice. Wall plug efficiency is important because if you need to run a nuclear power plant next to your collider to power it, nobody will want to pay for this. This is laser technology right there, wall plug efficiency. So you could go to IKEA and then you get last year's model. So we decided that's not the, the, the right way to do it. So back in 2009, we wrote a paper in Physics Today, uh, my colleague Eric Essary and I, just putting down sort of a straw man design for what a collider like this might look like. And it again, it takes elements from the conventional accelerators in the sense that it's broken up into sections. And here you see essentially these capillary discharge waveguides and we have chained together a hundred of them. Each one is supplied with its own laser pulse because after some distance in a certain module, that laser pulse will have depleted. You do the same thing on the positron side and there's some tricks that you have to play in terms of the field quality that you generate in there, but you can accelerate both posit positive and negative charges if you, if you do things right. And if you're interested in more scientific details, there's a, a physical review, special topics, accelerators and beams paper that we also published on this topic. So the idea was, let's build all of these modules. And one module would look like a 10 GeV device in about this distance, in about a meter. That's, that's the goal. This, is, this was a foundation for us to get funding for Bella, which is the Berkeley Lab Laser Accelerator Project. So we, we decided to think about what should the laser be like to drive one of these modules. So we based it on experiments, our GV results, our injection results. We did a lot of theory and simulations on either a nonlinear regime where you blow out all of the electrons. In this re regime, you cannot accelerate positrons. But in this regime, the quasi-linear regime, you have a wake that's very sinusoidal-like. And depending on where you put your positrons, you can accelerate them and focus them. So it led us to these parameters, a 40 joule system, 30 femtoseconds, stretchable to about a picosecond, with great pointing stability because you're aiming down the barrel of a device that only has a few hundred micron opening with this big hefty laser. So it better be pointed stably, otherwise you will blow up your structure in the first shot. So the laser also better be focusable and have great overall stability. Now we also realized that the luminosity part, we couldn't satisfy at this point. Luminosity will require 40 joule at 10 kilohertz, a 400 kilowatt laser. There's nobody right now that has that technology, but someday I hope we will. So we proposed the project in 2006, launched it in 2007, and we teamed up with Thales to build us a laser. We built this facility up in Berkeley Lab. Uh, we got it an old, old laboratory. Laser is on the bottom here. Power supplies are on the top. And this laser beam is guided through a set of mirrors, all in vacuum, into a target chamber, which is over there. And then it, it, the laser goes on its way towards this massive beam dump where we have lead, steel, and concrete to stop these electrons. So that's what the laser looks like. As I said, this was built by Thales, first in Paris. This is the front end of the system here. These are pump lasers. They call them Gaia pump lasers. There's 12 of them. Over in the back is the compressor. And these are the big amplifiers that bring up the energy to the 60 joule level. And this was the first laser that ran at one hertz. So you can see another picture here. Maybe I'll show just to favor the left side of the room a little bit. You have the laser, beam gets turned around, 
and this is the beam pipe that sends it to the targets. This part here is where the beam, laser beam comes into the shielded area, and this is the target chamber right there. Obviously, the whole complex is dominated by the size of the laser, not the accelerator. Now, as I mentioned, for this laser to be useful for us, to do science with it, and not be the experiment, the, i.e. the laser, we need a reliable laser. And so here is the stability. This is one hertz, this is the time of this laser running at 61 joules with 0.3% RMS. This is very important for applications. If your laser isn't stable, your electron beam energy will fluctuate. That means your FEL energy will, wavelength will fluctuate or your gamma rays will fluctuate. The other part which was very important to us is the quality of the laser beam. And this is the focused laser beam on target, which has a strail ratio of better than 0.9. The pointing stability we measured was around 1.2 microradian, so we see it move just a little bit on the target, but this is very satisfactory for us. So this is again on the, on the beam pointing and the, uh, the quality of the laser beam. So we did set a new world record with this laser. We reached, back in July, 42.4 watt average power with a petawatt system. And our simulations that we've done here you see a laser pulse, this red blob is a laser pulse propagating through the channel, exciting these waves. The bullet-like object right there is the electron beam that was accelerated. And our simulations indicate that with a 40 joule laser, we will reach roughly a 10 GeV electron beam with this device, with a structure that's somewhere less than a meter. Now once you have this, you have a driver for short wavelength FEL. You can also produce positrons with these intense electron beams. And you can do ultra high intensity particle photon interaction physics. And you can use it for ion acceleration, which I didn't talk about and I, I won't have time to, to talk about it. This is what the target chamber looks like. So the targets basically sit in this here. Laser beam comes from the right and goes to the, to the left. And then we have here a picture of the big magnetic spectrometer. This device is close to two meters long. It takes quite a bit of field to deflect a high energy electron beam. And then in the back here, you have the electron beam dump. So basically, we're chomping at the bit to, uh, to do these experiments. And I got permission from the Department of Energy uh, back in December to actually fire all of this up. So we're weeks away from getting our first results, I hope. Now, we are not the only big facility that is starting up. This is a map of Europe. There is three big facilities in the works under the Eli Delivery Consortium. One being built in Prague, the Czech Republic. This is a 280 million euro facility. There's another one in Seget in Hungary, also 280 million euro. And a third one being built in Romania. And these facilities here will basically provide multiple beams, 10 petawatt down to 1 petawatt down to high repetition rate system, all to basically f help our field advance faster than what we are doing right now with the availability of these state-of-the-art lasers. So in terms of applications, if you now have perfected your laser plasma technology, I've sort of sketched the picture for what we need to do in terms of collider technology, but that's probably about a decade or two away. In the meantime, we're working on these light source applications, medical applications, and security applications. But if you look at where laser technology is today, we are running with 10 to 100 watt average power. What we need for these applications is 1 to 10 kilowatt uh, uh, average power at these very high peak powers. And as I said, the collider is more than 100 kilowatt per laser system. And for a collider, you would need something of the order of probably 20 of them. So this is massive amount of laser power. So this seems completely crazy to even think about it. But we decided a number of years ago to launch a road mapping effort between the accelerator and the laser communities to define what challenges are ahead in terms of laser technology. 
So basically, you ask from the accelerator guys, what do you guys need? You tell the laser guys, the laser guys say, no way, we can't do this, but we could probably do the following, and you have a dialogue going. And so this resulted, if you're interested, there's a white paper published with findings from these two workshops uh, that we held. So all of them need more average power. And here are an example of a three kilowatt laser. Suppose you could build today a three kilowatt laser. Depending on who you talk to, they will want that three kilowatt in a different format. You have the guys doing high energy density science. They need a lot of energy in a single pulse and they're fine if you do this at one hertz. This is the type of physics that's relevant to fusion, to high energy density, warm dense matter. Same here for shock physics. And if you have three joules at 10 hertz, you could do ion acceleration. If you can deliver this at that rep rate, people that work in the ion acceleration business say you are at a level where you could actually compete with cyclotrons in terms of proton generation for medical applications. If Bella would be able to run at 100 hertz, you'll be able to build a LINAC, a 10 GV LINAC at 100 hertz. That's comparable to what the two mile long device that Slack was running. If you can do three joules at a kilohertz, we could build a GV LINAC at a kilohertz, which would be a fantastic tool in anyone's lab. Those that are doing high harmonics would like lower energy but very high repetition rates, 100 kilohertz. And then there's also dielectric laser acceleration, which wants even higher repetition rates. So this would be sort of something that we would all would like in our labs in the next five years. So the question is, what needs to be done? So there's obviously lots of work, and I, I wish Andreas was here because he's one of the leading figures, and I, I think I see Jens there as well, Jens Limpert, uh, in, a, in many of these developments, as well as other groups here in the US and overseas, in amplifier technology, fiber combining, coherent fiber combining, where you take one fiber, maybe it runs at a millijoule, and you combine a thousand of them so that you have your one joule at high repetition rate. There's also need for new materials, high damage threshold coatings. The only reason the Bella system and final focusing is so long is to protect the last mirrors where you're dealing with a petawatt and you need to focus that down to, to a relatively large, uh, sorry, relatively large spot size. So your mirror is going to be the weak link in your system. So if we can get coatings developed that have much higher damage threshold, maybe a factor of four, hopefully a factor of 10 someday, you could actually shrink the whole system down by a factor of three in, some, in terms of over, overall length. So this is very important. The other thing I mentioned also was wall plug efficiency. We would need to run these lasers at the 30, 40% wall plug efficiency to have enough efficiency not to worry about the power bill when you're running a big light source or a, a big collider. So diodes, small quantum defect materials for optimal pumping, these are all essential technologies that our community will have to develop. So let me conclude here. I think it's, I've been in, in this field for now 27 years, started with CO2 lasers, switched over to TISAF lasers, and we don't know what the technology will look down the road, but just having reliable, stable, tunable lasers available really revolutionize our field. But we need to push it one step further, and so we need a revolution in laser and optics technology for continued success of the revolution in accelerator technology. And I'll, I'll end with this slide here, which is the same image as I showed in the beginning, but I added this quote, people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it, from George Bernard Shaw. I gave this a number of years ago, the same slide, and Walter Henning, who was director of Argonne National Lab at the same time, piped up and said, and hopefully we will not have to wait another 80 years. And with that, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Um, I learned two things. One is there will be benefits working in California near the beach. 
The second <laughs> thing is that we know the answers now that there's no single laser can solve all the problems. All the problems require different type of lasers. With that, I think I'll open the floor for maybe a few questions. Yes, can you please come to the microphone, please? Um, uh, as the mirror is a weak point, have you ever tried to think about getting rid of um, mirrors by having different structures? Could you repeat the question, please? Have you tried getting rid of mirror requirement? Mirror? Requirement. Um, well, maybe if the, if the fiber combining would work to a degree where not only do you do the, the pulse combining in time so that you get away from your grading based compressor and then you do the combining in space in such a way that the fibers are arranged that you don't even need a final focusing optic, then yes, we would be, it, it sounds completely fictional but that's, those are some of the ideas that are being worked on to get away from these final focusing optics. Because otherwise your final focusing optic, if you look at the collider application or even the light source application, that mirror has to deal with 10 kilowatt and these high uh, fluences. So if we can come up with technology that would get rid of mirrors, I hope the, the mirror manufacturers in this room are not offended, but it would be fantastic for, for, for us. But I think this is decades away before we get to that point. Any other questions? I guess because, oh yes, please. Harry. My question, my question has to do with the target and the purity requirements for the target as you're making the plasma. What sort of defect densities do you need for the target or the impurity densities? So we typically run the, 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 the targets for the electron acceleration are all gas based. So we typically run helium or hydrogen in our, in our capillary discharges. Uh, one of the things that we do have to worry about is ablation from the walls of the capillary. And it's not so much the discharge. The discharge does, over time, erode the walls. But we can take millions of shots. You could argue, well, at 10 kilohertz, that's, a, that's still not enough. But the main damage that we see in the structures where impurities come drifting in to, the, to the, the, basically the optical waveguide is because of the laser interacting with the walls. If you don't control your mode matching of the laser beam into the fiber guide, into, the, into this plasma structure. So it's, the, the, what the impurities do is they will ionize further and they can lead to more trapped electrons. So uh, certainly we use right now mixes as well, gas mixes, to aid in ionization assisted loading of the, of the wakes. But uncontrolled impurities are certainly something that we try to avoid. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Dr. Lemus again.